Okay, hello everyone, and we have a very special video for you today. We're going to be discussing the Philidor position, and it's going to be a study Sunday session for chess meal. And uh, you can see here the Philidor position of queen against rook. But actually there are three Philidor positions and queen against rook is perhaps the third and least well known. Um, the second Philidor position is a rook and bishop against a rook and the most famous and probably most important Philidor position is defending with a rook against a rook and a pawn. So, and this is going to be a, um, a session for chess meal. Hi there, Chuck Moulton. Uh, so chess meal is just starting out and it's giving lessons on, on basic, uh, to start with, basic chess ideas. Uh, and this will be a session for the Study Sunday. And if you check out, if you Google on YouTube for chess meal, and there was a really interesting one last Sunday by Henry Lee, which is an FM, uh, and I'd never heard of this. It's called the Saavedra position. Really fascinating video, and I recommend you all check it out. Um, but okay, back to today. So today we're going to be discussing the Philidor position. And who was Philidor? So Philidor was this 18th century chess player and composer who actually wrote a book about chess called L'Analyse du Jeu des Echecs, uh, which came out in 1777, or the second edition of it did. Um, and in that, there was discussion of openings, and there were also discussion of many endgames. Um, and as it says here, Philidor's book was the very first to give detailed annotations on how to play the middle game present chess strategy as a whole and present the uh, present chess strategy as a whole and present the concepts of the blockade prophylaxis positional sacrifice and mobility of the pawn formation hi there got away safely so what we have for you today is a special uh, study sunday uh, sunday study session rather for for chess meal yes uh, if you check out last week's session by Henry Lee on the Saavedra position, that's very interesting. So today we're going to be discussing the Philidor position. And there are actually three Philidor positions. And they, they appear in a book by Philidor, so full name, François-André Philidor, um, born 1726. He actually died in London in 1795 because he happened to be in England during the French Revolution and couldn't get back to France. And then, well, you can read all about it on Wikipedia. Um, and he wrote this book, Analyse du jeu des échecs, where he discusses many, many things, and among them, these three very interesting endgames, which I'm going to discuss with you today. Now, the first, the most famous, and the most useful one, is how to defend if you only have a rook against a rook and a pawn. Um, and the first thing is you should always put your king in the path of the pawn. So you often have end games where your king might be, for example, castled on the king side, and white threatens to get a pass pawn um, on the queen side. So you might think it'd be wise to try and get your rook behind that pawn or some other thing, some other idea. But no, the best thing to do is to try and make sure you can run your king over to in front of the passed pawn, because it makes it very difficult for the pawn to promote if your king is in front of that pass pawn. Conversely, the side with the pass pawn, white here, will be trying his best to, to, to control a file to, um, to, to, block, um, to cut your king away from that pass pawn. That's the word. Okay, now in this position, in the Philidor position of rook and pawn against rook. So rook and pawn is desperately trying to win, but black can always def um, 
but black has got his king in a great position right in front of this pawn. And and it's here, it's actually, so this is the position, it's black to move. How does, so his king is in a great position, and the question is, where does he put his rook? And the third door position, the answer to where you put your rook is on the third rank. So that's why another name for the third door position is the third rank defense. And the idea of this is whatever white does, you've got your king in a wonderful position and you're going to stop the white king from supporting the pawn to queen and also from threatening checkmates. As long as the king is cut off from the third rank, white finds it very difficult to make progress. So let's just uh, play through a few moves. So we first cut him off. How on... Now, there's no way of mating me and there's no way of doing anything apart from unless you push the pawn at some point. Okay, but let's let's see. Suppose he doesn't push the pawn and tries to make progress. He could check me. I just move. He could check me again. I just move. He could try chasing the rook around. And what you do is you just move the rook up and down the third rank. So eventually in frustration, white will push that pawn. Okay, but actually there's something else white can try. He could try this, and cutting the blockade with his rook. Now, if he just does this, cutting it this way, this doesn't quite work, because then um, black controls the three squares in front of the pawn. And so if you know your pawn endgames, that means when the white king comes back to his pawn, black gets the opposition. So it's, the opposition is when you're exactly two squares in front of the opponent king, which means that white can't make progress. Black has always got the opposition. So he, he can always just drop back, drop back, and whichever way white goes, he will take the opposition. And eventually it's going to end in stalemate. Black has the opposition. Okay, so that's if, um, if white tries to cut like, like so. Suppose... Um, suppose something else happens. Suppose black is a little bit careless and goes king b8 and allows white to cut to cut the third rank like so. Now this probably is the only position um, in the in this Philidor third rank defense that you have to be a little bit careful. So what you mustn't do in this position is take that rook. You might think I take it, he takes back, and I get a draw. And that would be true. This this is in fact a drawing position. Where wherever you go, you just drop back. So this is always important, you just stay directly behind the pawn, and the moment the king pops up at the level of the pawn, you get the opposition. But no, if you take, he will take with the king. And you might think, oh, but it's okay, I have the opposition. No, not so, because you are when the um, because the pawn is actually reaching the sixth rank, and once the pawn reaches the sixth rank, it's no good having the opposition because you don't have that square behind the board to drop back to, as you would if it were if it were one rank further back. So this would just continue. You go here, go here. Now normally you just drop back a square, but there's no room on the board, so you're forced to come out, and then the white king comes in and promotes. So just to be really clear here, if you'd made a mistake and allowed um, and allowed this position to occur where the, the white rook is, is cutting is trying to cut your rank as follows. Then what you need to do is actually drop back to the first rank and and switch sides. So if the white king comes in Go, on, go to the other side and get back your third rank defense. Um, so remember, the, yeah, the, the rook must be, must be defended by the, must be right next to the pawn in this scenario. If the rook were here, then the king is too far away and then the king can come in and control those squares. So it's a scenario where the rook is, is very close to the pawn. You just switch to the other side. Now obviously, um, what could white do? White could just do this, 
but then you just keep on checking him from behind. So white needs to keep uh, in, in the shadow of his own pawn. Uh, what else could white do? White definitely can't move his rook anywhere here because it'll, it'll be lost to a skewer. Um, so what else can white do? So white actually is in a kind of zugzwang. He has to... He, if he stays in the shadow, then he has to move the rook. But the rook doesn't really have any good squares. So if he drops back, then we regain our third rank. And we're back to uh, our original third rank defense. Okay, so, so going back to the original position. That was just one position to be slightly careful of, where you might have to do checks from behind and then swing around to the other side. But eventually white's going to realize he's not making any progress, and that's when he pushes the pawn. Hey there, vsim in Twitch chat. Now the moment white pushes the pawn, and then this is the key of this Philidor defense, you again do that idea of swinging to the first rank and checking the king from behind. And notice that when the pawn is on the sixth rank and the king is perfectly placed behind it, this king has no shelter. Um, he can move around, but you just check it. If, for example, you try to shelter the king with your rook, well, you just take it, and you have the perfect defense here. It looks slightly scary, but the moment the king pops up, you take the opposition. So the moment he checks, you're back. So so this is the, the, point, the important thing is the king is sufficiently far away that you are controlling uh, these squares, unlike uh, what we saw earlier. So, OK, so we're going to throw, it, throw some checks. And the point is, this king can never avoid checks from this back rank. So what can he do? The only thing he can do is, oof, I don't want that one. The only thing he can do to avoid these checks is to come running after this rook. Okay, so what will happen if the king actually comes running after this rook? Well, we, we simply attack this pawn. And the moment he defends that pawn, we can bring our king in to attack the pawn. He can check us again, but then we just drop back again, and we're again threatening this pawn. So the king can't both defend the pawn and attack our rook. So it's stuck. The moment it attacks our rook, well, we, we take the pawn and exchange off. So that is the Philidor defense. Rook g6 cuts off the king. The only slightly tricky variation is where the when the rook ends up somewhere like here and the king tries to sneak in to the third rank. But then what we do is we check from behind and the king is has only one square free from checks, which means we can check from behind and the rook is in, in zugzwang. So the moment the king steps off, we check it. Um, and that forces him to move the rook away, and then we can uh, we can regain this third rank defense. Now, I said I was going to discuss the Philidor position, but it's quite interesting to see how. So the Philidor is we should do this and control the third rank. Now, suppose you're playing this game and you make a mistake, or your opponent makes a mistake and accidentally checks you from behind when the pawn is on the fifth rank. That is in fact a fatal error, because now white can maneuver into something called the Lucina position. Now although that's not the subject of this um, Sunday study on chess meal, so just to show you, this is, and I'll, I'll paste the, the link, so you should all subscribe to, to chess meal, this is um, uh, study Sunday we're doing on chess meal. Um, so although this this is not the, the topic, I think it's very interesting just to go over why, uh, how white can in fact win this position. So, so first what he does is he, he gets his king in front of the pawn. 
and th and this is the of course because the pawn is on the fifth rank there is um, a square of shelter where the king can hide and it turns out this rook is now a little bit out of place um, and what the threat is white can actually check this king and dislocate it from in front of the pawn the king cannot stay in front of the pawn or it's going to get checkmated uh, in fact if you just went king in front of the pawn it's not checkmate but it's just no good white's controlling the queening of that pawn so So what's happening is the black king is actually being evicted from its perfect position. So if you make this mistake of checking from behind, your king is actually going to get evicted. In the meantime, what's white going to do? It's going to slowly crawl up the board. You could check from the side now, but if you check from the side, I'm just going to go here. And you don't have the check here, skewing my rook. Okay, so he's just going to slowly creep up the board now, in this position, it's actually very important for black to control this file. Now, I, 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 black is in fact lost here, but his best hope is to keep the king behind the pawn here uh, with, uh, by control, stopping the king from exiting from one file and using the rook to stop it exiting from the other file. Um, and that makes it actually slightly tricky uh, for white to win, but white can still win. So just to show, if white, if black just plays something like this, then white has a very simple winning strategy. Take the king out. If you check me, just diagonally run, run up the board. And then queen my pawn. So it's a very simple strategy if you don't keep that king trapped. So it's very important to keep the king trapped. And now here is the Lucina idea. You move the rook to the fourth rank. Fifth rank is also possible. But fourth rank is making the perfect bridge, it turns out, because on the fourth rank it can't be ha harassed by the king. Um, so just to show how things could go wrong first, suppose you try to defend on the fifth rank. Rook b2, rook d5. And th again, this is a mistake. This is like, suppose you thought, I'm now going to cut off this king, uh, and then I'm going to move my king out and promote. There's a very tricky move that black would have in this position, which is rook c2, pretending, okay, come out. And this was this is white thinks that he is um, making a bridge here. Um, now, just to say, in this position, if this position ever did happen, the moment the rook moves off this file, white should immediately take control of this file and then he has a shadow under which he can hide. You might think, oh, but then black is going to come in and win this pawn. No, because the rook is going to come back and defend, the king is just going to hide behind the rook, and the pawn is going to promote. So this is a very simple winning strategy for white. So rook c2 is a mistake. However, it's tricky, because rook c2 invites... This is not the first move you think of. It invites another move, which is king b2, king b7. And you check again, king c6, you check again, and white thinks he's making a bridge, and he's then going to promote. And this, this is, however, a false bridge. You check, and the black king comes in, you have to defend the pawn, and the black king gets behind the pawn in time, and it's stalemate. So you have to be very careful. If black, in this position, goes rook c2, you go rook b4, and hide your king behind the rook. So it's a slightly tricky move that um, that black could play. If black were to maintain what I'm saying you, you should do, maintain control of this file, keep the king trapped, then what white has to do is push that king away. And this is what we're going to see in the main line. You might think, oh, there's a mate threat here. No, because the rook can come back and defend. And we're going to see this in the main line. And if the king goes further away, then again, we get behind. Um, we get behind the pawn, and we've created a space for ourselves here. 
and we can actually queen. There's the king is sufficiently far away we can escape and we're not going to get mated. Um, so that was all just a slight distraction saying about how you have to be careful after rook h4 and these rook, rook here tricks. But the correct bridge is actually to form the bridge on the fourth rank and we're going to show you just quickly, this is the Lucina position. Again, black should control this file so the king is, is trapped. Um, so the first thing you do is you push the king away. If the king actually tries to attack the pawn, you can actually hide behind the king and use the king as a... If rook here, we just promote, takes, takes. If rook here going for a checkmate, it doesn't work. We just saw already. So we're push So the king is actually going to be pushed away. And when the king is pushed away, then we come out. And you might think, oh, but now there's some checks. Check again. And because our rook is on the fourth rank, it can't block. But what we do is something very nice. We stay in control of the pawn so that if he checks again, okay, I should say if he checks again, we then do this. And if he checks again, we then form the bridge on the fourth rank. And the king is too far away to stop this pawn from queening. So if black is being a bit tricky, what he sometimes does, so I've made this the main line, is attacks our rook. And so what we should do in that situation is not um, so if I it's not to do for example this you, you might think doing this um, although that probably all that actually that also works it's completely fine so rook c1 king king here and, and that, actually that will work completely fine as well I was just going to check but even more efficient is is you throw in a check if he tries to harass your rook throw in a check and immediately, uh, this is much more pretty, immediately put your rook behind the pawn and you're going to hide in this little little hollow between your rook and your pawn. So let's just play that through from the beginning just to see what happened. If black checks from behind, you just you get the king out from behind the pawn, you push your own king behind the pawn, and then you form a fourth rank bridge. You check him to push his king away, and then you just... And, and you make a fifth rank bridge if he, if he harasses you, otherwise you, and you have a little home for your king and then you promote. So that is the Lucina position. And the reason it's important is because it's if you made the wrong move, if you didn't do rook g6 here. So in fact, there are only two drawing moves in this position. King c8, planning rook g6 next, is also drawing, it turns out, uh, or rook g6 immediately. So just to show, king c8 obviously makes life a little more tricky for you, but the idea is if the king were to move to the third rank, you move your own rook to the third rank. And if he tries to control the third rank himself, then I think we just throw in some checks. Uh, and we can keep on throwing in checks unless he goes here, Ah, and that's threatening checkmate. So it is quite useful that we went over this. There's only one drawing move in this position, which is king to b8. And that looks really scary. Because it looks scary because it looks like he can chase our king. Huh. So I was, I was thinking if it was white to move here, king to b8, look here. Um, so what's the idea of king to b8? So if he were to check us, we'd have to go king to a7. And so now he, he can try and do this thing of maneuvering his king up the board. So this is actually slightly scary, isn't it? Um, So apparently then we, we want to, I suppose he tries to, I suppose he tries to maneuver his king up the board, then we check, goes here, and then we go here, attacking this, and if we defend, well, 
we, we need to get we need to get White's king out from behind his pawn. So I'm wondering if that's possible. So it is quite hairy this whole situation. Um, king to d6 and try and check from behind again. Okay, so this is by no means completely clear. Uh, so if it were white to move in this in uh, this position in uh, in this position and white gains control of the third rank uh, after king c8, if white gains control, so black might be able to hang on by a thread. Uh, but this is a whole new thing that that needs to be studied. So yeah, rook and pawn endgames are not so straightforward. Um, and I'm not sure what, what Stockfish recommends is the best way of proceeding. Just king to c7, it says. Oh, that does make sense. Okay, so king to c7 might be a more, might be a better way of doing it, because I was thinking of something much more scary. Okay, so king to c7 is the way to do it. Because, of course, you want to stop that king coming into that safe square. Absolutely makes sense. Okay, so I, I'm very glad that I cleared that up, because... Uh, otherwise that's really scary. So if the, if the rook moves away, that's releasing the king to come in and control and control especially this square in front of the pawn. So I'm, I'm glad I cleared that up. So if white, if it were white to move and you um, you did a move like king c8, so that's why it's much clearer if, if um, as black if you go straight in with rook g6 and avoid avoid the complications. So basically all these positions are about controlling this square and the reason is this is the square in the shadow of this pawn, so it's in the shadow of the checks from behind. And the moment that pawn is pushed, there is no shadow, and so you can just check from behind. And and that's the that's the idea. Okay, so that is the first Philidor position, which, as I said, is named after this Frenchman uh, from uh, who wrote a book in 1777, at least the second edition of 1777, L'Analyse des Echecs. Uh, and I'm discussing it for a study Sunday session for Chess Meal, and uh, I, I'm recommending you all to check out, um, to subscribe to the YouTube channel of Chess Meal, um, and they'll have lots of interesting stuff in the future, because it's just starting out. Okay, so now we turn to the second Philidor position. Now this is a lot more complicated. If you thought that was, it's going to get, it's going to get a little bit more complicated. Um, but because there's still rooks involved, what you have to watch out for is when kings are opposed, the rook can check on the back rank. So if you could imagine this rook going here, that would be checkmate. So in fact, it's black to move in this position. But suppose it's white to move in this position. Black is toast because white would swing the rook over to the other side. And even if the black king tries to run to avoid the opposition, this square is covered by the bishop. So rook um, to h8 would still be checkmate. So fortunately for black, he has one move to try to, to remedy all his troubles. So now let's look where he can move the rook. He can't move it here or here or here or here. So there are three squares along the file where he can move it and two squares along the rank. And this is Buckhouse Chuck Moulton where we're downtime so nothing in hand. No pieces can be laid on the board. Uh, so we have to, as white so white, so the last uh, Philidor position we discussed was a way for the weaker side to defend, whereas this Philidor position is in fact a way for the rook and bishop to win against the rook. Yeah, unfortunately, Chuck Walton, you're downtime. <laughs> so, yeah. So how how can he defend? Okay, so he can't move, so as we said before, he can't move the, um, actually he can't move the rook to here or here or the king to here because the problem, the problem is the same. The rook would swing to the other side, threatening this mate, and there's basically no defense. You can, you might be able to throw in a check, but you can just defend the check. 
and the mate threat remains. In fact, this bishop will now cut off the king. The best black can do is, is go for a, a, a rook against a king. Uh, hi there, Isa, Fulpez. Great to see you. Um, so you've missed the first Fyrdor position, which was the third rank defense, but you know all about that. Um, so now it's going to be yeah, rook against king, and okay, we all know how to checkmate a rook against king, but in case some of you are just starting out, you'd obviously just try and keep the king in the corner and checkmate. But just, just for the sake of argument, suppose you made a bit of a mistake, and in this position it was your move. I think this is quite quite useful one. If you ever were in this sort of position and it's your move, it's quite annoying because you can't do um, you can't do the checkmate you wanted to do. Um, and so there's a very important endgame concept, and that's the waiting move. You just wait along this file, the king has to go back, you can move to any square along this file, and it will work just the same. And then you deliver checkmate. So it's a very important idea in endgames, the waiting, the waiting move. Which just comes up as, a, as an aside. Now, going back to this original position, so we've just seen that moving the king, yeah, moving the king is equally hopeless. Because even if you keep on moving the king, you have this beautiful bishop and rook checkmate. Um, so, in this position, moving the king is hopeless, moving the rook along the rank is hopeless. So, the best thing you might hope to do is to move the rook along the file. And there are three squares, as you can see. Well, we'll look at the worst, and we'll actually come back to the worst at the end, because the, the technique for this endgame is to force the rook to go to this, uh, to go to progressively worse and worse squares. Um, now, rook d3 is the worst. Now, why is rook d3 the worst? Okay. So the reason it's the worst, and it's not exactly simple, is this square is controlled. And it turns out this square is a useful square, so we'll see why. So first we deliver a check in the center, forcing black to make a choice. If he makes the wrong choice, if he goes this way, our job is very easy, because then we just swing over to this side of the board and deliver checkmate. And you might think, oh, but black can swing his rook over to defend, defend the mate, but he can't because the bishop is controlling that square. And even if the, yeah, that's why, no other reason. So, wow, that's really nice, right? Okay, so this is the important thing. This bishop is actually going to be really useful because it's controlling the squares from which the rook might actually want to come back and defend the king. The king might be here or here, and this is why this third rank for the rook is not a good rank. So that's why the king can't go that way. Um, so is that completely clear? If you go this way, this, if you try and run again, this is just checkmate. So what else could he do? If he runs this way, it's just checkmate. If he tries to bring the rook in defense, then you just take it, and it's an easy, easy win. Okay, so when you check him in the middle, he's forced to line his king and rook up, like so. And now what we're going to do is threaten checkmate here, noticing that this square is cut off, and the rook can't ever swing to here because this file is blocked. So notice how the bishop is doing a great job protecting the king from checks, and we'll see this even more in future. So all black can do is keep running, and then what you do is you deliver another check. And again, if he makes the wrong choice, if he goes here, we have a very easy task. We just deliver a check. If he moves the rook in the way, we take it, or else we just take the rook next move. So this is a very forcing move, because it forces the king back. And then, so this is looking kind of complicated, but and we, then we drop back to the fourth rank. Um, and 
And what this is, is a waiting move. We saw this earlier with just a king and rook against a king. It's a waiting move. Uh, what's also taking the, the rook out from... Well, it's it's doing many things at once. It's saving that rook, so, the, so, so we, our bishop is now free to move. It's dropping the rook back. But crucially, it's dropping it back to the fourth rank. And you'll see why in a second. And the threat is bishop here check. And this rook cuts off the king, so the king would have to go to here. And so rook here is checkmate. So this is a really serious threat. Bishop here check, rook here checkmate. And one thing you might think you could do is just keep running the king and then defend rook here with rook here. And this is why the third rank also doesn't is not a good defense for the rook, is if black goes king d8, you can drop your bishop, blocking this file, so now we're threatening mate, and also stopping checks on the king. So now we know why we drop back to the fourth rank. So what does black do? He might go back to stop the checkmate, and then we deliver the check and checkmate. Boom. So, wow, that all seems rather involved. So let's just, just quickly see that again. If the black rook goes to the third rank, we're going to deliver the check here. If he goes here, we're just going to swing over, over here and deliver mate. And using the fact that the bishop controls the defensive square, so he goes the other side, then we threaten mate. He keeps running, we throw in a check. He can't keep running, so he has to run back. And then we crucially come back to the fourth rank, threatening, check, and mate. So the only defense, so we said this doesn't work because of this, st stopping checks. But black does have another defense. Oh, we're not out of the woods just yet. Pinning the bishop. And what do we do now? We just move one step across and threaten checkmate here. And there's nothing black can do to stop this mate. If he keeps running, if he runs the king, this is still checkmate. And maybe the only thing black could do is to use his rook as a defender. But oops, that bishop was in a really good position all the way along. So just to say it again, in this position, if you go threaten the mate, check, drop back, if he tries to pin you, then you just uh, move a file to the left, and this is checkmate, and the place where he'd like to block, you capture it. Okay, so actually that was all the easy, um, that was the slightly easier version, where he drops back to the third rank. Uh, but fortunately, the hard version is you transform the problem into the easy version. So we've already said you can't move the rook along the rank or the king along the rank because the rook switches sides and checkmates. And what we've just seen here is you can't go rook here because you, you check and then threaten mate and then do this cunning fourth rank attack. So what black does instead is he goes to the second rank or the first rank. Now if he goes to the second rank, Actually, the second rank is the best. We've just looked at the worst, the third rank. The second rank is the best response. And the reason is because if the bishop ever moves, this is a light square which the bishop can never control. In fact, this move is so good that we're going to force the king away from the second rank. And the way we do that is by a waiting move. And since we're still threatening checkmate, and the king can't move to try and run away from the mate because this square is taken, all black can do is move the rook to one of the two yellow squares. He can't go all the way back here because otherwise we do what we saw at the beginning. If he goes all the way back here, we just swing across and checkmate, and there's no defense. So at that point, well, if he goes to, to, the, to the third rank, we've already seen what happens. So suppose he goes to the first rank. Okay, now the key to the first rank is we're going to have to be able to control checks from this square here with the bishop. If we ever move the bishop, we have to be able to control checks from this square here. 
So what we do is we swing the rook over, threatening checkmate here. And again, remember he can't move the king to defend against these mates because the bishop is controlling um, these, these dangerous squares. So the king is really in a bit of a pickle, but he can defend with the rook. And then we swing over to the other side. Now, just going to the beginning, we're now lining up the rook and bishop so, so that we can push, uh, bring this bishop back to here, controlling this square. That's the idea. So that's, that's the reason why we, we went up and then back again, is because we want the rook on this file. So we go here, threat and checkmate, he has to defend. We then go here, and check, threat and checkmate, he has to defend again. And then we do this critical move of bringing the bishop back so he can't check us. And and why do we do that again? We do that because yeah, we do that because it's also controlling, not only is it stopping him from checking us, it's also controlling the second rank. So now the black rook, I mean, this is amazing, right? Now the black rook, we said it can't go to here because we swing over and checkmate. It can't go here or here or here or here. So there are only two squares it can go to, which are here and, well, there's only one square it can go to now. So before it had three squares it can go to, and it went to this square, and we forced it by a waiting move to go to one of the other two squares. If it went to the third rank, we're happy. So it goes to the first rank. If it goes to the first rank, we did this kind of very cunning maneuver of let's threaten mate, threaten mate again, and then with the rook and bishop connected like this, we force it to the third rank. And now we finally got the rook where we want it on the third rank. And now we can finish the job as we saw earlier by moving the bishop here, threatening rook here, and, and takes the rook, checkmate. And the end result of all of that is the rook just basically has to check us. What else can the rook do? If the king runs, it's going to be checkmate. The, the blocking square is now controlled. So all it can do now is throw in a check. But then we do this, and now it's black to move. And we're threatening checkmate. So all he can do is is go rook d, um, rook d3, and this is what we saw right at the beginning. If he goes rook d3, what do we do? So we don't want to throw in the check immediately, because otherwise the rook will come back and block. So what we do is we make sure the king and the rook get lined up. Remember, if he goes this way, we're very happy. And the reason we're very happy is because the bishop here controls this square, which is the square which he wants to use to defend. So he has to use the king to defend, but this is checkmate then. So he has to go the other way. And then what do we do? We threaten checkmate, pushing the king further. We throw in a check. Because of the discovery, he can't keep running, so his rook would come back and take the rook. And then we drop back to the fourth rank. Um, Chuck says, why not king d8 when the black rook is on d1? King to d8. So, oh yeah, so yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, so if he moves the king the other way, it's checkmate. So why can't he move the, oops, why can't he move the king this way? Um, so, what, so what do we do then? I think we're going to just, so we're controlling the checking square. So what we're going to do is we're just going to drop back to here, I think, and then throw in a check and then checkmate. So I think that's going to be our plan. So that's good, I, I hadn't discussed. Oh, I, I have it here already, rook c4. Yeah, so you just drop back rook c4 and the threat is bishop here check and rook here checkmate. And there is no defense. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing that can be done. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. 
So it's bishop here check will force the king back here, rook then, and takes will be checkmate. Um, so that's why he has to move his rook to his final available square, which is this. And then we threaten checkmate, he checks us, and we get back to this position. But now we are threatening mate, so black has to go here. And this is where, where we wanted the rook in the first place, on the third rank, because then we control these squares, which are the squares it can defend from. We throw a check in, get the king and rook lined up. We threaten mate again, push it again, rook here, check, king back. And rook to the fourth rank. This is what we began this whole position with, bringing the rook back to the fourth rank. And his only defense against bishop here, check, and checkmate is to try and pin it. And what do we do against the pin? We just slide across and threaten mate. And there's no defense. You could take the bishop, or you could go here. Either way, it's all over. And we, we're, we're left with the king and rook against the king endgame, which as we've seen, you just push the king to the edge of the board, and then if necessary, do a waiting move, just push it right into the corner and then deliver checkmate. So yeah, this, um, I always think that if I had good visual, uh, visualization, this would be um, a wonderful position. If I, if I had good board visualization, this would be a wonderful position uh, to try and develop, like as you're falling asleep, try to go through all the lines in this position. I, I think I've tried, but not necessarily always successfully. Go through all the lines in this position to see how you can win whatever black does in this position. Um, so the most complicated line we've seen was rook here, which is frustrating because the checks are not defended. So we do a waiting move. Force him to one of the other two squares, and now we're going to force him to the other one in a second. You threaten mate, you threaten mate the other side, but critically on the right rank now. And then you bring your bishop back, defending the check. As we said, king d8 would just drop back, threatening mate, so he has to go here. And now we're into the third rank. You threaten mate, and we defend, and again he has to defend mate. And then we do the central check. If he goes this way, we're going here and check mate. If he goes the other way, we threaten mate, forcing the king even further, and then throw this other check in, forcing the king back. And we have this setup, bishop, rook, king. And then we drop the rook back to the fourth rank, preparing this move. He tries, uh, sorry, preparing bishop here, check, king here. If the king moves here, then we have this move, stopping any checks. If he tries to run any further, it's checkmate. So his only defense is to pin it, in which case we do a very cunning move, sliding across, and we win the game. So it's, I think after doing this video, I think I'll be able to do this in my head, but it's certainly not easy. And it's very pretty. Now, the, that's the second of the three uh, Philidor positions. Which, as I said, we're covering for this uh, study Sunday for chess meal. It's usually supposed to be a 10 minute video, but I'm, I'm overdoing it. Um, the third um, Philidor position I'd like to discuss with you, and this is the motivation for the whole video, is queen against rook. And this is something I'd, I'd like to discuss more in future, of how to win queen against rook. So yes, I think it was um, Jess AF in chat said, rook and bishop versus rook is the hardest end game to defend versus perfect play. Absolutely. I've seen Caruana and other super GMs have winning positions and then mess them up or vice versa. Have drawing positions and fail to get the draw. Um, now queen against rook, there are strategies, um, and I, I hope to come back to this maybe in a, at a future in a future video. Uh, but this is the Philidor position, and so what we've seen quite a lot of um, in the last Philidor position is we, we discussed the idea of the waiting move. The other idea that comes up a lot in end games is Zugzwang, and we're going to see this again in, um, in this Philidor position. So Zugzwang is when one side has has no decent moves, whatever he does will lose. Um, in fact, we even saw that in the very first Philidor position. So Zugzwang is a very important endgame concept of when when the side would rather skip a move, but they're not able to. 
So they, they're forced to make a move that makes their position worse. Okay, now, if this is black to move, um, he's going to have to move the rook away from his king. The reason for that is he can't move the king, because otherwise we just pin the queen, uh, the rook to the king, and then take and take the rook next move. So black would much rather um, that it is white's move. So suppose it is white's move. Well, white has a very cunning way of flipping the move. It's like you can see a triangle on the screen. Um, the idea of triangles is that they have an odd number of sides, so they let you sometimes flip the move. So although it's white to move, white is going to flip the move, so it's black to move in this position. The way he does it is as follows. He goes queen e5 check. The rook can't block or you take it. The king can't go here or you, you mate it on the back rank. So it must go to the a file. And if it goes to the A file, wherever it goes on the A file, you then check it again, but this time from the corner. Again, and this is quite subtle, he can't defend with the rook, because then we actually have a kind of smothered mate, uh, which you see in the red square here in the corner. So he has to go back. And what do we do then? We go back to our original square. Just ignore all the arrows for a second. But we go back to our original square, and it's now black to move. So notice what we've done here. Check, check, and we go back to our original square, and now it's black to move. And now let's have a look at all these arrows. Well, the blue squares are all the forbidden squares for the rook. Um, the red squares are super forbidden squares. So, sorry, the red square here is a super forbidden square, because if the rook were to go here, queen to here is checkmate. So that's just, that's an absolute no-no. But if the rook were to go to here or here or here, we just scoop it up. If it would go to here or here, we just scoop it up. If it would go to here, we just go check and then scoop it up. And if it would go to either of these two blue squares, we have this check in the center of the board and then scoop it up. So, what, yeah, what, we, um, what I write here is for the door possession with black to move, we claim he is in Zugzwang. Um, okay, he could also do a king move. But if he moves the king, as we said here, if he moves his king to c8, we can just ping, pin the rook to the king, and then it's game over. So basically, he has to do a rook move. And there are only four rook moves, and they're all marked in green. They all look legitimate. Um, so let's start with... Um, sorry if I've got too many arrows on the board, but hopefully they'll become clearer over time. So suppose let, he goes to b1. So the point is, he's moving his rook away from his king, and the plan is um, white is going to try and pick up that rook with a fork. But going back all the way to the beginning again, um, this position. This position is interesting because the king is controlling the king. And notice how the queen is just like a, a, a little bit further back. But just in the next chapter, what I'll just try and show you is it's very dangerous to put the king and the queen both too close um, to the opponent king. A position like this is very dangerous. Black can actually draw in those positions. So that's actually why the queen is just a hanging back just a little bit. It turns out it's to avoid stalemate, tri technique, um, stalemate tricks. Um, but what the king is doing is it's controlling the square in front, in front of the king. And also just stepping back philosophically. How are we going to win a queen against a rook? The way we're going to win is because the queen can check diagonally, whereas the rook can only control files and ranks. So we're going to do this, and now the rook has only four safe squares, but crucially they're all far away from the king, and we're going to have to try and exploit diagonals in some way. So let's look at the first of these, rook b1. And before we even try to calculate anything, what I recommend in any such situation is look at the diagonal of the rook. And what your aim should be is to try and check the opponent king from the, from the diagonal next to that diagonal, so from this dark square diagonal. If you can check it along any square along this dark square diagonal, 
it's quite likely the next move you can just go to one of the two neighboring squares and then pick up the rook. And in fact, in this position, the square we're going to aim for is this blue square here, and then check and pick up the rook. That's going to be our aim. So first we check from the center. And the king can't go to the red square or queen there's checkmate. So it must go to one um, just one of these two squares at the edge. And there are many ways of finishing this off, but another nice one is if it goes if it goes to the corner square, we go straight to our blue square. So our blue square is our target square. So just go from the starting position. We check and we're trying to aim for this blue square because it's next to the diagonal of the rook. If he goes here, okay, we can't go to our blue square, so we throw in another check. Notice he can't block with the rook, or queen takes rook. He can't go to this red square here, or queen here is checkmate. So he must go back to this, to this rank, to the eighth rank. And now we're on the blue square, and now we're going to pick up the rook. So we're very happy. So what if instead he'd actually went he'd actually uh, gone to the third rank we could do the same kind of thing of queen here check queen here check go to the blue square we could go there check again and again he can't go to ever to here because always the queen can swing all the way down to here and it's checkmate i mean the rook can block but just take it so we can just kind of okay so let, let me show it to you if the rook were to go here, we can go queen here, check, king here. And what I'm saying is we could go here and then here to that blue square. It's not necessarily the most efficient way of doing things, but we can go to the blue square if we wanted to. And then crucially check here, not here, because we want to keep an eye on this square. So if he comes here, we're going to have this. So we throw in this check. Um, so he has to go back onto the eighth rank, and then we pick up the rook. Um, but that's not a, so okay. So that's one way of doing it, very similar to the way we did the last one. But actually, we can go even quicker by just going queen here check straight away. Again, if he goes here, we go here. So he goes here, and then we throw in a check. So we have a one move quicker. So. So that's why going to either the first or the third rank isn't going to work. There are two more green squares we need to check out. What about going to this one? We're going to do exactly the same thing, except now we're going to aim for the opposite corner. And the reason is because you want to look at the diagonal of that rook, and you want the, the square next to the diagonal of that rook. So again, you check in the center. You can't block with the rook, or you take it. He can't go here, or you mate it. So he goes here. You get to that blue square, and notice if the rook were actually here, then you'd check here next, and he can't go here because then you could go queen here, mate, rook here, queen takes rook, is checkmate. Uh, so then he'd have to go back into the, in, onto the um, first file and check again, and then you pick up the rook, using the, following the blue path, basically. Or if he does this, we just take it like so. So we see wherever the rook goes, we have we can pick it up with these diagonal checks. Now just for fun, there's actually another way of doing it if the rook goes here. It's a very pretty way of doing it, but one I don't necessarily recommend because it's slightly tricky. And that's to go check like so. And if he goes to the blue square, we go check again, and he goes here, check again, and pick up the rook. And if he goes here, there's a very cunning move, a very important move for white in this position. It's a very important move he finds it. Because if white had done this, he now doesn't have this sort of back rank mate. The square is controlled. But this is the, the, the key move. You threaten mate here, which I've just killed, and you threaten mate here. And this is a perfect example of Zugzwang. The king can't move. It's stalemated at the moment. So the rook has to move, but wherever the rook moves, 
it can't defend these two threats because it's on the one square already that does defend these two threats. So this is just the perfect example of Zugzwang. King is paralyzed, rook can't move. You could try a rook here, check, but we just take it and it's not stalemate. King can still go here. So now, of course, there's simple ways of doing uh, of doing. If if in reality you got this in the game and the rook went here, I would recommend you just follow exactly the same pattern. Just go queen here, check, threatening mate here if he comes here. So he has to go somewhere into the corner. And then remember, just look at the diagonal of the rook and look at the square next to the diagonal of the rook. So we're looking at um, these two squares. That's where we want to check the king. So what should we do here? So we want to check it. We want to check it on this square especially. So maybe we just go queen here check. So if he comes here, we just throw in a checkmate. If he goes here, okay, that's fine. Then we go here. And eventually we've got it where we want it. We've got the queen on this square here. If he goes here, we have queen here followed by mate. So he has to, he has to go back to the first rank and then queen there check and we pick up the rook. So that's th that's the kind of strategy you want to follow. Okay, so going all the way back to the original position, we first switch the move, and then wherever the rook goes, if he goes here, we check him in the center, aiming for this square, and then pick him up. Or if he goes here, again, we check him in the center, and we pick him up like so. Just always making sure. Hi there, Ominous. So uh, as, as I've been, uh, we're doing a, a study Sunday session for Chess Meal. Um, so I'll just put the link. So you should all go and subscribe to, to Chess Meal um, for, for your chess, some little chess insights. And I'm just doing a special little video for them. Um, and what we're doing today are the three Philidor positions. And what we've just seen right now is the third Philidor position. So that's it, guys. No, not quite. I want to show you just a couple more things, which is the stalemate cage. So the Philidor position, uh, notice how the queen is just, a, just hung back a little bit. Now this position, you think white is completely winning. No, it's actually a draw. Because the king is in fact trapped on these th in these three files. The king can never run here, or the rook here would pin the queen and the king. So the rook can actually check this king ad infinitum. You might think, well, can't check him here. Well, actually, yes, he can. Because if the king were to take that rook, it's a stalemate. Now, if the king had another file to run to, because you could imagine this whole position shifted to the left, then the king would have to run to that extra file and then the rook would come back to harass the queen and black has delayed mate by about 20 moves. So this is actually both a drawing technique and also a delaying mate technique, which is worth knowing. So check, check, check. And in fact, if the king were to go here, we actually can just get it all over with by throwing an in check here. And where whatever the king does, if he takes the rook, it's stalemate. If he doesn't take the rook, he's losing his queen. So he does this, then he's losing his queen, and he better take it back. So this original position, which looks as if white is in full control, sure, if it was white to move, he was he is in full control. But if it's black to move, this is a draw. The moment the king goes here, the rook goes here, and the queen is pinned. So the queen can't move, and then you're picking up the queen next move. So, so, that, so we've seen the third Philidor position, the second Philidor position, it's really beautiful position of rook and bishop against rook. So rook and bishop do defeat a rook. 
queen can defeat a rook, and this is the technique in this position. And to begin with, uh, was the opposite. The opposite: a rook can defend a draw against a rook and a pawn as long as the king gets behind the pawn, and the rook creates a third rank defense. So that's kind of it for today. But just as a quick uh, thing to finish, let's just say something about the Philidor defense. So the Philidor defense is a very defensive setup for black where instead of knight c6, black goes d6. And bishop c4 is, is quite normal, but probably even more common is d4. So as black, um, as black, I've seen Mamed Yarov play e takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, bishop e7. So it's quite a passive setup for black. His bishop's kind of blocked in by the pawns, but it's playable. Um, it's not so bad. Um, instead of e takes d4, there's also something called the Hanam or lion variation where you go knight f6. Uh, so just as follows, bishop c4, and... It's like a so it's a d6 e5 setup as opposed to a French e6 d5 setup. Um, so that's called the, the lion or the black lion as black. And Philidor himself had a rather crazy idea, which is to go f5. And the computer best move against f5 is bishop c4, but the most practical way of playing against f5, which is just a terrible opening, is just to take that pawn. Because if uh, black takes your pawn, you take back defending the pawn, and you're a pawn up. And if if black takes the pawn here, then you just take here, and you're a pawn up. I mean, this is terrible. What's going on here? I mean, and so probably black's best move, if you do take, is to push, like in the Albin counter gambit. And then you go here, knight g5, he then takes back, you then go knight c3, he tries to defend the pawn, and then the key move is f3. And he might try to defend, but the point is you just take, take, you get to keep on taking until the d5 square is vacated and you get your bishop c4 move in. And f7 proves to be a really big weakness. Um, in black's position, and basically this is just not a very good position. Um, white's going to castle, have a nice rook file, a lead in development, great attack, f7 is weak. So not much to be said for that opening. Um, so that's what happens after d4. So f5 is not good, but that, that f5 is, um, is called a Philidor counter gambit, um, but almost never played. I think Nakamura tried it once and lost. So bishop c4, this is another way white might play, and there's a little trap here. In this position, black has to take the knight, I think. I can't believe this actually happened. Bishop h5 has apparently actually happened at the master's level, which I'm just baffled by, but okay. Because after bishop h5, white has a very nice move, which is knight takes e5. Um, free pawn, uh, losing the queen. So, because if if knight takes here, queen takes bishop, knight takes c4, queen here, check, and you're picking up the knight. So you just won a free pawn. Um, and if black is greedy and takes your queen, then this is actually Legal's mate. You take the pawn, and you see this a lot in Bug House as well, in Crazy House, where you can suddenly drop pieces around the opponent king. And that's checkmate. Two knights control a lot of squares, if you actually examine. They control a line of four, and then even some, and even the edges. So actually a line of six, almost. A bendy line of six, and a straight line of four. Two knights together. Um, in the meantime, they also control those two squares. 
So in fact, the only two squares the knights don't control are the squares directly in front of them. But the bishop controls one of them, as well as controlling the square behind the king, and the pawn blocks off the other one. So this is Legal's mate. You give up your queen and checkmate. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed the stream um, discussing the three Philidor positions of François André Philidor. Um, so do check out uh, the YouTube link of Chess Meal, which I posted in the chat. Uh, do check out my own YouTube. Um, and but there I mainly post Crazy House videos. So this uh, will maybe be um, appearing on the Study Sunday today if I can work out how to upload it to to the, uh, to the Chess Meal. Um, okay, and do all subscribe to Chess Meal to to get your to get your fix of more of this sort of educational content. And Isabelle says, pawns are strongest in the phalanx. Yes, and something I say from Crazy House is that knights are usually strongest three apart, and queen and bishop are also usually strongest, or bishops are usually often strongest. Well, they're obviously strong together, but also three apart. People don't realize this. Um, but I haven't got a blank board on which to look uh, to explain it. Um, but I just need to find an empty board somewhere. So imagine if I have two knights here and here. They actually control a whole square and also a whole square underneath as well. Um, so if they're in the center of the board, so two knights here and here, they're controlling these four squares here, these four squares here, and also some other squares in this quadrant, and this quadrant, and this quadrant, and this quadrant. So there's six kind of quadrants, um, but especially these two two by two squares, which is why I sometimes say that, that two knights, three apart, um, are like a knight cube, because they because this is one face of the cube, that's another face of the cube, and there's a whole other set of squares, just two squares here, two squares here, that they also control. So they're very powerful. Um, you can create mating nets with two knights three apart. They work together fabulously. Um, and what's interesting is now suppose those knights instead of bishops, then they still control those two squares. So two, haha, <laughs> that's funny. So two pieces, which are three apart in this way, Um, are incredibly powerful. So yeah, so obviously bishops together are powerful because they create a wall. But bishops um, three apart like this, so yeah. And bishop and knight four apart, that's true. Yeah. And the reason bishop and knight four apart is because you want the bishop and the knight on the same color so they control squares of opposite color because the knight will control squares of opposite color to whatever square it's standing on. Um, but yeah, what's interesting is bishops and knight, bishops, so bishops three apart and knights three apart like this are very powerful. Imagine if those two are queens like this. Look how many squares in the chessboard would be controlled. Uh, but yeah, if it's bishop and knight, then four apart is very good. Okay, so hopefully this has been a fun and instructive stream. I'm just going to remove, remove that from this. Um, so we began with rook and pawn against rook. First fiddle position, cut off the king. And we said some very interesting things like if the rook tries to, to grab that rank, then bring the king in to control this square. This is the key square you need to control. And if, if the rook tries to come and exchange off on the third rank, you have to drop back to the first rank and try and get to the third rank from the other side and stuff like this. And then we looked at rook and bishop against rook, which is just a gem of the whole... Uh, there are three squares available for this rook and you just push to one of the other two squares. And then you push to the third one, and then you threaten mate, and then you get the king and rook lined up like this, and you threaten. Um, if, if, he, if he pins you, then you, um, if he pins you, then you threaten mate here, and if he moves the king, then you, you drop back, controlling the checking square, and and there's nothing he can do because if he does this, we're going to do this, this, and checkmate. 
Okay, so thank you all for watching. Um, that's the end of this stream. Um, someone is sending me a crazy house challenge, which is normally what I do, but not hyper. So, um, and normally I just I don't yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in crazy house, do check out my YouTube. Um, but no, I'm not not going to be playing any crazy house today because I'm doing this special stream for chess meal. So I hope you've all enjoyed it, um, and thanks for watching. Uh, I should say, and the third, the third one, which is of course this one, and that's the one we we start. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, and that's the one which um, I'll, I'll mention at the end. The third Philidor position. Okay, thanks everyone for watching.